Us Trails fans can always expect phenomenal music to accompany us on our journeys through Zemuria. Some of my favorite video game tracks of all time come from these games, and I'm beyond thankful to all the composers, musicians, and everyone else involved in creating these amazing soundtracks. So, for a series that's so meticulous with its world building, the music has definitely played a vital role in setting up the scenes and locations we've come to know and love. And as a preface, sorry that I can't help but overanalyze music sometimes because of the profound impact it's had on my life. I'm blessed to have attended a school district that really made music education a priority, meaning orchestra and choir has been a regular thing for me since early elementary school. Most of my fondest memories and meaningful friendships in high school and college come from chamber orchestra, wind ensemble, marching band, jazz band, and so many other experiences I was afforded via those music programs. And huge shout out, by the way, to my fellow trombones. Now, I don't want to get too into a certain rumor that's been going around in Falcom circles for the past couple weeks, However, I do want to shine a spotlight on the Falcom legend, Takahiro Unisuga, and just how adept he is at creating music that establishes the setting in these games. And so with that said, I'm gonna be focusing on a lot of non-battle and, quite frankly, underrated tracks that just don't normally get brought up in Trails conversation. And lastly, I just want to put up the disclaimer that this video will have spoilers for the Sky, Crossbell, and Cold Steel arcs, including Cold Steel 4. So consider this your final warning. Now, starting with Unisuga's work in the Sky trilogy, the track I really want to focus on first is the Overworld track of SC. Looking up at the sky is perfectly in sync with one of the main aspects of Liberal's lore, and that's its status as a small mountainous nation that primarily relies on airship travel. And taking that one step further, it's Liberal's airships that save them from a full-on Erebonian takeover during the Hundred Days War. So with all that in mind, I think Unisuga's choice of instrumentation is key in capturing this feeling of high elevation in this track. The percussion, especially the steady rhythm of the drum's hi-hat, really nails that feel of rotating airship propellers and the wind that gets stirred up. It's particularly effective in all those scenes involving the Arce. And the focus on the higher register instruments, for the most part, like the xylophone or glockenspiel, also establishes a very light and airy feeling. You know, like that slight breeze that's surely present on the mountainous trails the Skycast travels during their journey. And knowing that these travels were what brought the party closer together, Unisuga capitalizes on those feelings and brings the main melody back as a leitmotif, a term that's usually shortened to just motif. It's incredibly effective in whereabouts of bonds, you know, the one that plays during the big character development moments like Agate and Tita's. Bringing back motifs draws on the player's emotions and thoughts that have already been established in songs that have previously featured said melody. This gives motifs the ability to further build upon this emotive foundation and is why the feels hit us so hard when we hear the same motif again. Unisuga is truly adept at repurposing motifs, and I'll bring up a couple other examples when we get to the Cold Steel arc. But first, I really want to talk about one of my favorite OSTs from Sky the Third. So, Aster House is the track that first plays when we reach said area, or at least the memory of it. Right from the get-go, this song perfectly nails those nostalgic, warm, and cozy feelings we get from listening to Christmas songs. And how does it do this? 
Well, the instrumentation, for one, draws on characteristics of classic Christmas songs, and having a children's choir is very common in the church tradition. What with kids often learning Christmas hymns and carols while growing up. As such, the children's voices really sell the setting that Astor House is a Septian church-run orphanage. The bell-like instruments, like the glockenspiel, emulate that sleigh bell sound we associate with Christmas, and the string bass has that really nostalgic vibe like Bean Crosby's White Christmas. And finally, that beautiful oboe is perfect for this type of music when it comes to its timbre or unique character of sound. You see, oboe has been traditionally used in what's referred to as pastoral music, which is a style that tries to evoke rural life. And that's just what we need for Kevin and Reese's old home, right? But as we come to know, it's not all just cozy nostalgia. There's a tinge of the ominous, like something is not exactly right with the picture, when we hit about the two minute mark in the song. The strings and harp progressing in the chromatic chord fashion that they do draws attention to that, especially the piano's descending notes around 2-12 mark, before finally returning to the cozy, nostalgic vibes when it loops back to 2-30. This track perfectly sets the stage for Kevin and Reese's reminiscing, as well as the tragedy that occurred under Astor House's cathedral. It encapsulates the nostalgic yet pained feeling, or in other words, something bittersweet. So it was great usage of this song when it was played again the moment Kevin and Reese finally got the opportunity to say goodbye to Rufina for good, though they sadly had to put her down themselves. Now, the final track from Sky that I need to talk about is, fittingly, the final choice. The drum most associated with the military is the snare drum, since they were historically used to help armed forces march in straight lines steadily towards battle. And that tradition, without the armed part of course, has been carried on by drum corps and marching bands. And in this track, the emphasis is placed on the typical instruments used in these ensembles, namely drumline and brass. The track starts off so strong, with the snare and bass drum setting the pace, then proceeding to keep steady time. The cymbals embellish the track by adding this heightened sense of grandeur, while the brass finally add the fanfare, like we the player are truly entering an important battle of some kind. And like we talked about earlier with looking up at the sky, the synthy percussion in the beginning here is used to evoke this image of airship propellers continuously circling. Now from the minute mark onwards, the strings carry this light and flighty feel, perfect when the courageous takes its maiden voyage in cold steel. So yeah, we can picture ourselves on some epic high-speed flight just from listening to this track alone, though the main thing the song is trying to symbolize goes back to the military tradition I talked about before. The final choice symbolizes Olivier's challenge, his declaration of war, to Osborne from all the way back in the third that gets a callback when it's later reused for the same kind of scene in Cold Steel 1, over five years later. And that's not all. From the 150 minute mark onwards, a melody that resembles the main Heimdall phrase begins and continues till around 240 minutes in. So it never ceases to amaze me that Unisuga more than likely knew what he was doing, taking inspiration from the final choice when it came to composing Heimdall all those years later, which is one of the most important motifs in the Cold Steel arc. But yeah, that about covers the main things I wanted to from Sky, so now we can move on to the Crossbell arc. Three tracks to be specific. The first of these is Temptation of Wisdom, and once again, Unisuga nails the appropriate feel right from the very first measure of this track. 
we're hit with that heavily accented first note from the lower register instruments. They continue to establish the first beat of every measure and give off the eeriest gut punch, if I can call it that. Immediately, we can feel a deep sense of dread and foreboding. And to contrast the tracks we just listened to from the Sky Trilogy, when you remove the bell-like instruments, suddenly the drum's hi-hat takes an ominous twist. It's like that slight whisper or sound you might hear in the dead of night, but can't be sure where it came from, or even if you heard it at all, actually. It really builds up the uncertainty of the two settings it plays in, when we're navigating through the dark of the blacked out hospital and in the underground cult lodge. The track continues to build on that uneasy feeling at the 32nd mark, adding the ominous echoing back and forth between the lower and upper register instruments. And by the way, I think the symbolism is rather sinister in hindsight since we learned that Zero's opening dungeon is the exact place the DG cult used to conduct their practices. These musical phrases chiming back and forth to each other, in my view, resemble the deranged beliefs that get stuck in the cult member's echo chamber. So overall, I just think Temptation of Wisdom is an overlooked track for what it does so well, setting the eerie, foreboding atmosphere and just urgency of the situation. Now next up is a fan favorite, Afternoon in Crossbell. Like nearly all the Unisuga tracks we've talked about so far, the use of percussion here helps prop up Trail's world building this time featuring the kabasa, which looks like this, by the way. This track reflects Crossbell's urban setting by establishing the quicker pace of life and the modernity of the city. You see, the kabasa is a modern instrument when it comes to general musical repertoire, since it didn't gain popularity until Latin jazz really started taking off in the mid-1900s. The sharpness of the synth that begins at 23 seconds also points to the quickly modernizing city, with all the technological advancements it's made. Overall, Afternoon and Crossbell just has a different feel from Unisuga's ambient sky compositions. For one, the percussion and bass are much more punctuated here, which immediately gives a different vibe from the light and airy feeling of SC's overworld theme. Plus, the prominent bass line in particular resembles the slow plodding of overworked feet as Crossbell's citizens steadily make their late afternoon commutes home. But then the serene melodies of the woodwinds point to that feeling of relief knowing they're headed home from a long day. It's like Unisuga just knew this track would play for every scene that took place in late afternoon or early evening, when certain friends like Noelle would be calling it a day after helping out the SSS. Now let's move on to the final track from this arc, Steel Roar. In both its versions technically, though when it comes to my overanalysis, I'll ask you to take a careful listen to the first version, Verge of Death. So we begin with heavy accenting from the strings and percussion section, especially that heavy left hand of the piano. Then notice the snare drum backing the entire track, the instrument very much associated with military bands, remember? Since it's so prominent, we know something very serious is about to take place. The first two whole notes, or long drawn out notes of the brass, mimic the sound of air raid sirens. Then the large ensemble, led by the strings, come in, giving a taste of flight. Yet this time it's on a much grander scale than any of the tracks in Sky, due to just the sheer number of instruments playing in unison. In this sense, it's more akin to a whole platoon of aircrafts, like bombers and airships taking off for battle. Then, at a minute in, the brass add a markedly harsher sound, 
perhaps symbolizing the heavier ground artillery proceeding forward, ready to lay waste. There's also a synthy sound peppered throughout the track, which to me resembles gunfire. Then at last, at the 1.30 mark, the heavy atmosphere culminates in the pipe organ. Now there's just the somber flames of Gehenna left after the destruction and carnage. This track is the perfect accompaniment to the two major scenes it played in. When Randy was challenging the Red Constellation's forces alone, and most importantly to me, Calvert and Erebonia's official invasion of Crossbell. I'll never forget that feeling of tense horror seeing the heavy forces encroaching on the small autonomous state from both sides. And since this track really stuck with me, it was so cool to recognize it immediately when it appeared again in Cold Steel, when Class 7 was getting a taste of just how powerful Erebonia's military capabilities are. But yeah, I'll stop there when it comes to Unisuga's tracks in Crossbell. So now we can move on to Cold Steel's OST, starting with Berea Hard. So this piece is quite a different sound from what we've heard before from Unisuga, and it's all in order to capture the dignified elegance of the Erebonian nobility, starting with his choice of instrumentation. Unlike the tracks we talked about earlier, no heavy percussion is present at all here, aside from the piano of course. This is because he's basing Berea Hard's musical style on that which the real-life nobility from our own world enjoyed, something referred to as chamber music. You see, historically in the classical era, nobles would pay famous composers to create music that would be played in a smaller setting with a scaled-down orchestra. Or in other words, a much smaller group that'd be able to play directly in a noble's private castle, as opposed to a full symphony in a vast concert hall. These smaller ensembles were called chamber groups and were all about balancing the ratio of sound, most often lowering the ratio of strings to woodwinds. Like, instead of having the average string section of 20 plus violins, 10 violas, 8 cellos, etc., just a couple or even just a single person on a part is used for chamber groups. One reason for having just a couple flutes, a single clarinet, first violin, and so on is so that each individual instrument has more opportunity to shine and emulate this feeling like they're conversing with each other. An example of this kind of musical conversation is the part from the 120 mark to 2 minutes in. Various different instruments get to solo the main melody. Each one's phrasing just flows easily from one to another, emulating the natural conversations occurring in a noble's parlor. But lastly, going back to the 120-ish minute mark, the piece takes on a rather melancholic turn, which perfectly reflects that feeling we know to be true once we learn more about the Erebonian nobility. While they still clearly hold a lot of power in the country, their days of complete rulership over their provinces is fading. It's just another example of how well Unisuga is able to capture the story's thematic concepts in music form, and in turn, add to the world building of the Zemurian continent. So let's move on now to the seemingly opposite setting, with Heimdall's OST. The beginning of this track is already much different, since the percussion section is back in full force. And what's most noticeable to me is the choice of marimba, or vibraphone? Sorry, I'm not well versed in percussion enough to tell which one it is exactly. But anyway, the constantly moving lines of this instrument gives this track a much more modern feel, since it wasn't until the 20th century when these two instruments started seeing regular inclusion in musical repertoire. 
Notice that you can hear that kabasu we've heard back in Crossbell as well. Yet at the same time, Heimdall's track still very much embodies a traditional orchestral feel compared to Unisuga's more modern and jazzy afternoon in Crossbell. This is because he still includes a full string section, unlike the Bureahar track, which is really noticeable at the 30-second mark, and a full flute section, heard a minute in, all which creates a robust orchestral sound, just like one you'd hear in a classical concert hall. This combination of modern yet classical styles perfectly builds on Heimdall's lore, since unlike Crossbell City, there's a lot of emphasis placed on the history of the Erebonian imperial family, Emperor Dreykul's, and by extension, Heimdall, where their seat of power rests. Yet at the same time, Heimdall is an urban city, where the power of the common people grows as it enters a more modern age, just like in real life history. And when we directly compare it to Bereahard's track, Heimdall distinguishes itself with a quicker tempo, symbolizing the hustle and bustle of this urban city. However, similarly to Bereahard's OST, Unisuga uses historical influence of our real world to inform his composition of this track. For example, the part from 15 seconds to the 45 second mark emulates the traditional work songs, commonly known as sea shanties, that were historically sung by sailors, merchants, or in other words, commoners and the working class in general. The hallmark of this type of tune is that it's easily singable or hummable and features a call and response type of verse. A person with a strong voice would take the lead, singing their verse solo first, then everybody else would repeat or echo the same verse slash melody. So in this sense, in Heimdall's track starting at the 15 second mark, the single piccolo sings the solo first, then the string section repeats it. This is perfect for distinguishing Heimdall as the working class stronghold, and ultimately where commoners are gaining power within Erebonia. We associate characters like Chancellor Osborne, Governor Regnitz, Machias, Elliot and his family, and many other commoners of Erebonia with the capital city after all. Then when we get further into the track, the tune we've all come to know and love begins a minute and 16 seconds in. Yep, that's right. It's the Heimdall motif that draws upon that melody we talked about from Sky Third's final choice and ends up coming back in so many OSTs throughout the following Cold Steel games. From Awakening Will to Phantasmal Blaze in CS2 to Majestic Roar all the way in CS4. Unisuga does a fantastic job at repurposing motifs, and this particular one that originates from Heimdall perfectly fits as an anthem for the Erebonian arc. Or actually just Erebonia as a country in general. And yeah, I mean literally as an anthem, like in the term national anthem. Musically, this means a melody that's easily picked up and singable, and purpose-wise, a country's national anthem is meant to eulogize or praise the history and traditions of a nation. And one of the main themes of the Cold Steel arc is no matter what ideological side these characters find themselves on, they are all proud Erebonians in the end. That's why bringing this anthem back in Awakening Will works so well symbolically since all the Thor students on board the Courageous, both nobles and commoners, are proudly fighting together for the future they wish to see in their country. Plus, we can't forget that Erebonia's most prominent historical figure, Emperor Dreykul's main motto to future Thor students is, Arise, O youth, and become the foundation of the world. 
So clearly we can see how treating the Heimdall motif as a national anthem meaningfully adds to the Thor student story in CS2. Same general idea when it comes to Majestic Roar. Even though Chancellor Osborne and Class 7 are on opposing sides, they are both still fighting for what they believe is the right future for Erebonia. And of course, we can't forget that Osborne is the reincarnation of Emperor Dreykels himself. So once again, the Heimdall Anthem perfectly encompasses the nation's history, its present arc, and its future. Uh, I still have so much more I could say about other motifs in the Cold Steel arc, like the ones from Glimmering Tomorrow and Spiral of Erebus, but I've rambled on enough for one video. But hey, if you enjoyed this and want another video like this, leave a like and maybe even subscribe. Also, I would love to hear how you interpret the tracks I talked about in the comments below. Or even just which OSTs are your favorites of Unisugas in general. I also need to give a huge thanks to Joseph, Arvin, Katora, and everyone else who were and are involved in the massive project to credit the composers of the Falcom tracks we know and love. I could not have made this video without the spreadsheet. Link below. So thank you for all your hard work. Otherwise, join the Discord if you want a cool place to chill, and follow me on Twitch and Twitter if you wish. And finally, I'd like to thank all my patrons for their support, especially Jared Breland, Andreas Hansen, Captain Hobo, NT Luck, Big Clingy, Sam Bezjack, Thomas Perez Jr., Francesco Santoyo Rigo, Silverwind847, Safia Selvaraja, M. Meownalan, Gigi Sora, and Platinum Rose. Thanks for watching, guys, and until next time, take care. See ya!